Thanks. Let me see if uh, everything works here. I'm trying to get my clicker to change screens and I can't seem to make that happen. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, hearing you fine. Yeah, I can't make my, I can't advance my screen. Click, click into Not, the screen. Do, do a little mouse click into the screen. Yeah, yeah. So um, mouse click, try and confuse it, then see if it will. There you go. It's changed. We've moved on. Yeah. Oh, good, good. You good. sorted it. I don't know how that happened, but anyway. Okay, well, good. So um, my name is John McDevitt. I'm based in the Mid-Atlantic. I do spend a lot of time down on Ken Island with Randy, but I live outside of Philadelphia and I, I basically cover the Mid-Atlantic area. The Jersey coast is nearby. Uh, I, I enjoy marine electricity and uh, marine fire protection and I've made some presentations here in the past. Uh, this is gonna be a pretty fast paced uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, might not have time for questions and answers afterwards. Maybe we will. If not, I'll display my name, phone number, which is also in the uh, uh, program. Uh, I'm a member of SAMS, uh, AMS. I have a 100 ton master's license. I'm on my sixth issue. Um, I'm a longtime member of NFPA 302 Watercraft and um, also uh, chairman of that committee. I uh, spent uh, 20 plus years in the fire service outside of Philadelphia. Uh, the, the information I'm going to present here is, um, I'm trying to see, I'm having a problem with my screen. I, I, can, I can talk my way through this, but I'm missing some of my notes. Um, the information presented here was primarily obtained through the NTSB report, uh, photos, facts, data. Um, whenever I talk about fire protection, I, um, I try to talk about prevention, detection, egress, and suppression. That covers um, all the buckets that you would need to be concerned with. Uh, in this case, we're going to switch out prevention for cause and origin or origin and cause. And um, the, uh, uh, what I'm going to cover is the NTSB's concerns and then their recommendations. And in the middle of that, this was a subchapter T boat. I'll cover uh, what the subchapter T rules were. Um, <clears throat> the vessel was, uh, uh, had twin Detroits, 55 kW generator. Um, really had plenty of um, uh, amenities for diving, uh, sonar, uh, radar, autopilot, AIS, all of the whistles and bells that you would expect a boat like this to have. <clears throat> the, the boat was a subchapter T vessel. Uh, it um, uh, was uh, subchapter T vessels need to be inspected uh, every year. Uh, every other year, that inspection is an out-of-the-water inspection. Uh, in this case, the last inspection before the event was in February of 19. And um, uh, the, uh, the, the results of that inspection, which was an out-of-the-water inspection, the results of that inspection were um, uh, no violations at all. And uh, I'm actually trying to work on my screen here and uh, I'm sorry, but I can't, I can't see my notes. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll cruise through this without them. The last John, inspection you, was- John, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If, you, if you want, I can talk you through it very quickly, but if not, just let me know. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Todd, I'd appreciate it. Okay, certainly. So go to your um, share screen button on the bottom of yeah. your Zoom. It, it's it's covered my uh, my screen. I'm I'm looking for. Okay, you have to go back to your Zoom. You hit share screen and you go to advanced. All right. I missed that. I'm sorry. What what were you struggling with, John? I can't see my notes. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, Todd's right. All right. There we go. There we go. You got can it. You, can, can you see uh, the most recent? Coast Guard inspection? We can. And okay, we can great. see your notes as well. 
Um, uh, so okay. That, that should get you through. But if you want further assistance, you go to share screen. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't have any curse words or any bad pictures <laughs> in there. So, so you can you can see the notes and the, it'll help out, I guess. This is what I hope to see, but now everybody can see it. Anyway, the most recent inspection, uh, uh, there were no discrepancies reported in the most recent inspection before this event. Uh, also, in the NTSB investigation, they determined that uh, the boat uh, at the last inspection was in total compliance with the applicable regulations pertaining to fire safety for this class of vessel. <clears throat> uh, here's the basic layout of the boat. The bridge uh, had a pilot house, a crew quarters, and a sun deck. The middle area, which we'll in this presentation refer to as the galley, um, the salon, the common area um, is in the center. Um, in the back of that, there is a, a deck that was for diver preparation, uh, getting their gear on, things like that. And then in the lower part of the boat, uh, it shaded in pink there, is forward is the bunk room where the deceased, uh, unfortunately, were. Uh, after that is the engine room, and after that is the, the uh, lazarette. Here's a, a view of the, um, uh, the, the upper deck uh, from right to left, uh, pilot house. Uh, then after that is uh, the, the staterooms for the crew. Um, it's, you'll see four beds, but in the upper right bed, they're bunks. So there was room for five people to sleep up there. And then the sun deck after that. Um, Mid-level common area is the... Uh, uh, area where the fire occurred. Um, there's fixed seating on the port and starboard side, uh, fixed tables in front of that, and then uh, loose chairs, plastic chairs um, that, that go into the other side of the table. The uh, forward uh, port side is the galley. It was a big galley with plenty of equipment. Uh, and then forward on the starboard side were two sets of stairs. One set went down to the shower area. That's the forwardmost set. And then the next set right beside it uh, goes down to the bunk room. Uh, the, in, in the after that, uh, you'll see one that says up, that's the bridge steps up to the bridge. And then the aft deck was where they prepared the divers. This was the uh, sleeping area where the uh, unfortunate uh, people were. Uh, and again, from the right to left, uh, you'll see the hatch for the anchor room. Uh, you'll see the shower room. Uh, then after that is the bunk room. The little yellow square is the secondary means of escape, uh, which we'll talk about. And after the bunk room, you'll see the uh, uh, engine room. And then after that is the lazarette. <clears throat> the company, the boat was owned by Truth Aquatics. Uh, they have been in business since 1979. Um, they uh, had a very good reputation. They were well regarded among their customers, employees, and regulators. Um, they had a good reputation for being uh, operators that took care of things. Uh, they, uh, the uh, U.S. and Coast Guard inspector uh, actually said that they've always had a great relationship with them. <clears throat> the uh, customers slash uh, victims, um, there were 39 people on board the boat, uh, 33 passengers, six crew. Uh, ages uh, 16 to 62, uh, 13 males, 20 females, and two of the females were under the age of 18. Uh, 33 passengers and one crew perished in the fire. Uh, there was a marine biologist, a scientist, an engineer, and a family of five celebrating their father's uh, birthday. The captain was named Jerry Boyle, and he worked for Truth Aquatics since 1984. He had a 100-ton license since 85. Um, they found him responsible for the uh, 34 deaths, uh, citing a, a largely preventable tragedy, and he was charged and indicted on December 1st of 2020 um, uh, for misconduct, negligence, and inattention, in, <clears throat> inattention to duties. The crew was uh, made up of a second captain who was credentialed probably for about three or four months. Uh, there's two deckhands. And they, they helped out with the higher level support, the compressors, uh, helped the dive people a lot, helped with the boats, um, equipment, uh, things of that nature. Um, uh, two galley hands, 
uh, they took care of the, the galley and feeding the people. The, the customers got three meals a day on these trips and they took care of the cabin space and making sure that the people were fed properly and, and prepared their meals. <clears throat> the voyage was a, a Labor Day dive trip. Uh, there was an informal boarding process where the passengers started showing up anywhere from five or six o'clock in the evening. Uh, and then they went to bed. Um, some of the crew arrived uh, maybe 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and some even arrived about 3 a.m. Uh, because that would start about 3.30 and they would leave the dock at 4 a.m. Uh, AIS records said they left the dock that day at 4, 4 a.m. Uh, they were to dive a couple days um, and, uh, and then return to the dock about 5 p.m. on the night of September 2nd. Uh, guests all were divers that bought their own equipment, um, lights, wrist computers, uh, bottles, et cetera, and Truth Aquatics provided food, refreshments, compressed air, et cetera. <clears throat> Alcohol was uh, uh, allowed, but it was a bring your own. This is a, um, a little layout of the crews. They left Santa Barbara, which you can see in the upper right hand of this. Uh, and they cruised around to Albert Anchorage and then back up to Smuggler's Cove where they spent the night of the 31st. Uh, then they went to Quail Rock and, and dove there at night and then left that night and went to Platts Harbor and anchored out in preparation for um, another day of diving the next day. The Conception Dive Boat Disaster. Uh, about 3 a.m., uh, things really went south for these people. Um, th this was the worst maritime disaster uh, in the United States uh, since the uh, USS Iowa's turret explosion in uh, uh, 1989. So this is the worst loss of life on the water since 1989. <clears throat> Uh, as far as loss of life in, in terms of fire losses in the United States in the past 10 years, this is fourth, uh, only to be out distanced by the Cal Fire and the Camp Fire, which were, were wildland fires. And many of the people that died in those fires were in their own homes um, and, and it was their choice to stay. Uh, the ghost ship fire was a... a a warehouse in Oakland, California, where it was a vacant warehouse and some people started moving in there and basically camping out in the warehouse. It became an enclave for musicians and artists and things like that. And they just had a fire in there one evening that killed 36 people. Then after that, of course, the conception. So in terms of fire loss, whether it's sea or on land, this was devastating. Some other notable uh, marine accidents we're all familiar with, Edmund Fitzgerald, 29 lives. The El Faro, which was Hurricane Joaquin five years ago, uh, down in the Caribbean was 33 lives and uh, the Costa Concordia over in the Mediterranean was 32 lives. So the conception exceeded all those losses of life. A, um, a rough timeline, an abbreviated timeline, the NTSB file is, is interesting to read. It's, it's very detailed and deep. Um, and, and this information is available in a more detailed fashion. But, but basically, uh, one of the galley hands woke the crew just to three, four, uh, the there, couldn't get down the steps off the bridge deck. So uh, they were forced to jump either into the water or to the front deck. Uh, captain reported on the radio, the VHF, mayday, 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 and then I can't breathe. Um, first, uh, <coughs> they, they jumped off the boat, gathered the tender, uh, and went to a vessel called Great Escape, at, Great Escape at, anchored nearby and made another VHF call uh, to the Coast Guard where they first started to understand the gravity of the situation. Uh, first arriving units didn't get there for nearly an hour and a half. Um, the, the fire boats first arrived and started putting water on the fire almost five o'clock in the morning and the uh, conception eventually sunk about 7 a.m. that morning. So as I said before, when I talk about fire protection or fire investigation, there's four classifications that need to be included. Cause and origin is replacing prevention in this case, ghost fire event. 
but detection, egress, and suppression are key. Um, the NTSB was not granted access to the captain in this event um, because of the magnitude of the nature of things. Some investigative info was examined and shared. Some investigative info was, uh, I'm sorry, examined and not shared. And then some was neither examined or shared. So, so the, the, there was some information turned over to the NTSB. There was some information shown to the NTSB, but they weren't allowed to share. And then there was some information that the NTSB had no access to at all. <clears throat> Survival info, uh, the crew the crew survived because one of the crew members woke them up. Um, they, they got on the radio, transmitted a mayday. The, the, there was a huge disconnect between the boat and the Coast Guard in terms of really understanding what was going on. When the, the captain uh, got on the radio and said, mayday, mayday, I can't breathe, the Coast Guard thought it was a medical event where they needed to get some ES, EMS underway to take care of somebody who had a breathing problem. Uh, when they got to the, um, the grape escape uh, some 15 or 20 minutes later, uh, and again, some of this conversation, the disconnect is amazing, but I mean, the Coast Guard's asking them, the, the captain's telling them they're, they're trapped, they're locked in the vessel. And the Coast Guard saying, well, don't you have a key? Uh, so, so it's an interesting lesson to see in an emergency uh, how important it is to be clear about what you're trying to get through. Uh, in jumping off the bridge, uh, two of the uh, crew were injured, one with a, a closed fracture of the tibia. They swam to the back of the boat, launched the tender, went to the other vessel anchored nearby and called the Coast Guard. Uh, the second captain and the deckhand returned to the conception uh, in search of survivors. They heard nothing, saw nothing, and eventually there were no survivors. Uh, coroner's report, cause of death, a cause of death in every case was listed as smoke inhalation. Examinations uh, documented 27 victims as being fully or partially clothed. Uh, one passenger was wearing a jacket, one holding a flashlight, one had plastic reading glasses entangled in her hair. Uh, many were wearing footwear, including the second deckhand who was down with the pass passengers. Uh, she had sandals on both feet. Four cell phones were covered in the possession, recovered in the possession of victims, and at least five other cell phones, excuse me, in the wreckage. Uh, uh, there were no visible signs of heat damage to any of the cell phones. There was probably information taken from the cell phones, but that was not shared and that was kept private, probably shared with the for next to kin. <clears throat> the NTSB concludes that most of the victims were awake but could not escape the bunk room before all were overcome by smoke inhalation. And I, I really believe these folks died a horrible death. Whatever woke the crew up on the bridge probably also woke the people up down below. Uh, other remarks, there was alcohol or drugs did not play a role. Uh, weather or sea conditions did not play a role. And the NTSB said that the uh, um, emergency response was adequate, but um, unfortunately, or appropriate, but unfortunately, because of the distance um, they had to travel and the rapid advancement of the fire, the, the responding agencies had no, no role to play in the, in the, in the whole um, devastation. <clears throat> Okay, and again, I wanna go back. Uh, when I talk about fire protection, I always talk about prevention, detection, egress and suppression. They're critical. They should be on every survey report when you're surveying a new boat. Um, and, and if you are an investigator, uh, we swap out uh, prevention for origin and cause and we continue. You need to mention, even if detection was not part uh, of the, the, the event, you need to say it wasn't part of the event. Uh, if an egress was successful and not compromised, you need to say that. And same thing with suppression. Uh, the boat was, uh, was picked up by a barge and taken to a, a government facility where they investigated uh, everything. Uh, the fire, the origin of the fire was if you could see my mouse here, was in this area right back here. The uh, starboard quarter of the common area uh, is where it's believed this fire to have started. <clears throat> the, uh, 
this is uh, the lower deck. Uh, the uh, the fire uh, origin seems to be to the right here and just beyond this view uh, back here. Um, you can see, uh, I'd, I'd like you to note that you do not see outlets anywhere along here. Uh, there are probably some electricity up there for the TV and the coffee maker, but uh, this is the, the starboard side looking forward on the conception. This is the port side looking aft. And once again, I, I, I will get into a little bit later on, but you cannot see any outlets here. This back here under the bulletin board is an outlet. It's the lone outlet on this side of the boat. And there was one very similar on the starboard side. <clears throat> uh, this view here is from aft looking forward, slightly to port from the center line. Uh, the the blued out figures, this was a photo shared uh, and, and they didn't want the people to be uh, identified in there. Uh, also in this view, notice the escape hatch here. This was the secondary escape hatch, and we'll get into that a little bit later on as well. So once again, the origin was determined to be back in here in the uh, starboard quarter of the common area. Um, and <clears throat> unfortunately, the fire cause uh, was listed as undetermined. This is what they were able to uh, salvage from the, the sinking uh, of the boat. Uh, this is what was left of the upper deck uh, this is what was left of the main deck, and this is what was left of the lower deck. Uh, a, a lot of this was consumed by fire. Uh, some of it um, may have uh, uh, floated away if it wasn't consumed by fire, but it was very difficult to come up with anything beyond what you see here in this photo. Um, there was no flammable products on the boat in terms of uh, CNG or liquid, pro liquid nitrogen or propane. Uh, everything was electric. Uh, there might have been some gasoline for the tender, but it would have been back here in, in the lazarette and no volatile products played any role in this. This was a normal combustibles uh, fire event. So the three causes that the, uh, or per, perhaps four, that the NTSB listed were uh, the vessel's electrical distribution system, uh, unattended batteries and charging equipment, improperly discarded smoking materials, or perhaps another ignition source. <clears throat> so let's look at the, uh, the ship's distribution system, electrical distribution system. This was a 1981 boat that was nearly 40 years old, uh, operating in a salt air environment. Um, so there, there could have been some compromises to the system there. Uh, the boat um, was not, it was built for divers, but, but when they built the boat, they had no idea that the divers were going to be using, or for that matter, all of us were going to be using devices that needed to be charged overnight. Um, and the divers, they, they bring all kinds of gear with them, from lights to cameras to uh, scooters that help them maneuver around that all need to be charged. The crew did some of the electrical work on this boat. Um, and I, I um, spent some time in the fire service, and one of the things we used to see is somebody would be unhappy with the 15 amp breaker tripping on a 15 amp circuit, and they would solve that problem by switching out the 15 amp breaker with a 20 amp breaker, which was still protecting a 15 amp circuit. Uh, I can't help but but think of those kind of events when we look about talk about what happened here. The crew did the electrical work. Uh, the vessel was cited in 2000 for non-compliant wiring. And this was wiring that was installed when the boat was built. Uh, and again, uh, there was a, an inadequate number of outlets in here. Uh, for the amount of charging that needed to go on, um, they probably should have installed other outlets and some charging stations. Uh, so, so these outlets in the back on the port and starboard side we're doing far too much work. <clears throat> the second potential cause is, and these are, you know, we all know about lithium ion batteries. Um, we've heard about them for years and, and this could certainly be part of the problem, the fire problem right here. Uh, again, you know, they, they plug the power strips into power strips, but you know, right in this picture right here, there's probably six or seven different devices being charged. 
Uh, this picture, as are some of the others, were taken uh, either prior to the event or on the other boat. They had another boat, the Vision, which was identical to this one, built about the same time. <clears throat> and here's another photo. This is the outlets that, that I suspect had something to do with the fire, whether it was the electrical system itself or whether it was uh, uh, the excessive uh, charging of different uh, lithium ion type devices from here. <clears throat> Uh, you know, there's a lot you could do these days with with this type of thing uh, and protecting against that, and 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 it wouldn't have cost them a lot of money to to go ahead and and provide for this this kind of protection when they they knew they had this kind of problem. The, the, these are all normal practices um, for us. You know, we we do charging in our homes. We might have some aged electrical systems in our homes, uh, so there was nothing unique about this fire. Um, and of course, we're getting into the, the smoking problem now. Uh, improperly discarded uh, smoking materials could have been a problem. Uh, these trash cans were uh, non-compliant uh, and they were never written up by the Coast Guard. Um, were, they were frequently moved in and out of the salon area. So, you know, the, some of the crew or some of the guests might have smoked. Uh, there was, you know, um, some indication that some people were socializing at about 1130 after most everybody went to bed uh, and that perhaps a cigarette was discarded in one of these trash cans. So they couldn't rule that out. So um, prohibit smoking is, is a big deal and they probably should have played a, a better role in that than they did. So three potential causes, the ship's electrical systems, the um, charging of lithium ion batteries and uh, potential discarded cigarettes. These are everyday causes of fire, like I said, that could happen anywhere, uh, just any, anywhere. They're not unique to a boat. So prevention and origin and cause, they're stage one. And before we move from prevention and origin and cause uh, into the next three, uh, stage one is to prevent fires. Stage two is to prepare for the fires you can't prevent. And that is detection, egress, and suppression. And and, I, and I'll tell you right now, and I'll tell you again later, uh, the Coast Guard really got the detection and the egress part wrong uh, on these boats, these subchapter T boats. And and largely we do in the pleasure boat side as well. <clears throat> the uh, uh, as I said earlier, I'm going to present the NTSB's concerns. Then I'm going to present the rules. And then I'm going to present the NTSB's recommendations. So there were two detection concerns on the part of the NTSB. One was the lack of a roving patrol. And the second was the lack of smoke detector requirements in all accommodation spaces. So first let's cover the roving patrol issue. Uh, this is a law that became in effect in 19, I'm sorry, 1871. Um, it was uh, a requirement in both old chap subchapter T, new subchapter T, and the vessel's COI, uh, COI being certificate of inspection. Uh, the NTSB's informal discussions with other owners and operators uh, found that the, the requirements for a, a roving patrol were loosely administered. Um, they didn't understand they were subject to different interpretation the captain of this boat felt having one of the crew members in, in the bunk room with the guests uh, in the roving boat. Um, the second part about this was it could not be verified. The Coast Guard cannot verify that anybody's doing a roving patrol. Uh, and the third part of this is the Coast Guard hasn't written a citation in 30 years to anyone anywhere in the United States for not complying with the roving patrol rule. So the old subchapter T rules, they called it a patrolman and they had to do it when the bunks in the passenger areas were occupied. The new subchapter T, they changed it to a watchman and uh, he wanted, they told him to patrol through the vessel during the nighttime uh, when it was carrying passengers for overnight. So they changed the word wording, but it was about the same. And then the wording is even a little bit different in the vessel's uh, certificate of inspection. Um, and the passengers at bunks are occupied. You needed to provide a, 
roving patrol. So it was very loosely administered. And, uh, uh, you know, w when you write rules with the expectation that there, you should have the expectation that they can be verified and you should accept responsibility for monitoring the rules. And, uh, and they, they didn't do this. Uh, so otherwise, you know, you really, in my opinion, shouldn't make the rule. Uh, that rule went back to 1871 and, and unfortunately, uh, um, I, I don't think it has much teeth today. So the second detection concern was for smoke detection, the lack of, uh, of interconnected smoke detectors in all accommodation spaces. Uh, when you see the quotes and the uh, Times New Roman text in my PowerPoint, uh, this is directly from the, the NTSB report. Um, when you have a fire and everybody's sleeping, it creates a very difficult situation for uh, egress. Um, the conception had no smoke detectors anywhere in the boat, including where the, the fire started. Um, and the fire above them really just was well developed and, and, and prevented them from getting out. When you have a fire, the most important consideration is the time that passes between ignition and suppression. And that's why the big red trucks have lights and sirens and air horns and don't stop for red traffic lights in your neighborhood. That's why we have smoke detectors as well. We need to shorten the distance between the time of ignition and the time of intervention. And when you don't have smoke alarms in a place like a boat where we have a lot of combustible materials and a very restricted limited egress, you're, you're, it's, it's just not common sense. <clears throat> These people spent a lot of money for certifications, for diving gear, for equipment, uh, for the trip. Um, they, they came with cameras, flashlights, scooters, uh, a number of different things. They spent thousands of dollars. The ship's owner, he spent a lot of money for all of the gear to entice these people uh, to come to his boat. Um, stoves, uh, food preparation, autopilot, chart plotters, video depth finders, uh, a lot of safety equipment, EPIRBs. The, the subchapter T rules for, for uh, high water alarms is about four times the requirements for smoke alarms. Um, anchor alarms, life jackets, life rafts. I could go on and on, even stuff that's not listed. Pair of uh, wireless interconnected smoke alarms, $67.40 a pair. And they should have been, I, I own a 40 foot boat and I got six on my boat and I have had them for, for decades on my boat. <clears throat> uh, high water alarms, anchor alarms, we're all over this boat. Uh, it's just rock bottom common sense. Uh, I, I've done a lot of captain's work on boats over the past you know, 25 years or so. And I traveled with smoke alarms because when I got on a boat, even a brand new boat, and I had to move it from Annapolis to Florida, um, I, I would put one smoke alarm lower in the boat and one smart smoke alarm higher in the boat, uh, just so I could sleep better at night knowing they were there. So uh, smoke detection, the old sub T rules, there were no requirements. Uh, the new sub T rules, uh, there are requirements, at, and this boat met them. It was for uh, smoke alarms in the sleeping areas, and and uh, and that's it. And and unfortunately, uh, this wasn't even a grandfather situation. This is just a situation where they um, they didn't require smoke alarms anywhere that the bunk room, and that that was just as of 1996, and that requirement even in 96, in my opinion, was woefully inadequate. Uh, other standards, the ABYC on A4, they finally got into the smoke alarm requirement game in 2018. And that was because ISO uh, put a standard in and they try to, um, they try to uh, uh, be consistent with ISO and ISO uh, put a smoke alarm requirement in at 15, much to their chagrin. NFPA 302 has had a smoke alarm requirement for for some time uh, back around 2002, I think we did that. Uh, I would characterize the, the smoke detector requirements as loosely written. Um, uh, one of the things that I had a number of conversations with the NTSB 
um, after this event. And one of the things that came across in one of those conversations was they criticized me as chair 302 because in 302, we do require smoke alarms in boats with accommodation spaces, but we don't specify the location they should be installed in. So we'll, we'll look at that. And I think we all need to take a look in the regulation side about you know, what we're doing when it comes particularly to egress and detection. This was where the, the lone smoke alarm in the boat was. It was, uh, there was two, uh, one in each aisle on, um, uh, in these boats down in the sleeping area. So let's move now to NTSB recommendations. Um, they want them to develop a, a procedure to verify that there's a roving patrol in place. I just, like I said before, I think this is an unmeasurable, unverifiable, toothless requirement. And I, I think fire protection should be um, a, a, another kind of installation. I, I, I think the human uh, factor in fire protection is, is not, not a good idea. Uh, their requirements and smoke detectors, their recommendations for smoke detectors are to require all vessels with overnight accommodations to have interconnected smoke alarms in all accommodation spaces. So let's look at egress now. Uh, Coast Guard uh, um, concerns, or I'm sorry, the NTSB concerns with egress was inadequate emergency escape arrangements. Uh, the victims unfortunately were awake and they could not escape. And both means of escape led into the same common area. And, and that, that's a big problem. Um, as I said, this was the bunk room here. This was the secondary means of escape. The fire started in this area above, but it filled this entire area here. So it was, it was a difficult exit up these steps because this area was, was full of hope, smoke and heat. Uh, and this area right here, it discharged into the area very close to where the fire started. This is, oh no, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you see me? You've lost your PowerPoint. I'm sorry. That's good. Okay, it's not what I wanted you to see, but I'll continue. <laughs> but I can't advance my slides now. I just click, let do a left mouse click in the screen. There you go. Yep. Okay. This is just another rendition of the layout of the bunk room. Um, the, the, the stairs that went up there, they, they cleared a, a bulkhead there um, forward between the crew quarters and the, the shower room. <clears throat> this is a, again, another view of the bunk room. This is the starboard aisle. The port aisle was, was identical. This is the main egress. On the left, you're looking down. On the right, you're looking up. There was no door or bulkhead uh, uh, separating this area. So there was probably some people that ventured up those steps uh, from the, the bunk room and, and saw that it was too heat, heat and filled with heat and smoke. <clears throat> and this is the uh, secondary egress from the bunk room where um, the um, uh, difficult second egress was on a, uh, a bunk. You had to climb up onto a bunk. And then this is where it came out of uh, into the, uh, the second level. Sorry about this. Okay. Um, yeah, th this is the uh, area where the, the logistics of getting 34 people out of a space like this um, is just uh, impossible. <clears throat> Here, here's another shot of the other boat. Here's a, a person trying to, you could see the difficulty they would have. The FAA has a, a, um, uh, a, a process they go through where they need to get all of the people out of half the exits within 90 seconds. I don't know that they actually do that, but that's, that's a progression they use and a goal they shoot for. Uh, the rules, the subchapter T rules 
Uh, this boat was built in 1981. Uh, so uh, the old sub chapter, chapter T rules applied. Uh, the old sub chapter T rules um, for egress were very brief and not very detailed. But because this boat was built in 81, they were grandfathered in for this boat. Uh, the new sub chapter T rules uh, are far more robust, but did not apply. <clears throat> uh, just, a, a, and I, I, I tried to avoid reading all these rules and the egress rules on the new sub chapter T are a couple of pages, but I will state that they, they do say to minimize the possibility of one incident blocking both escapes. And they also say um, must be sufficient for rapid evacuation in an emergency for the number of persons served. So if they had pressed a little further on this boat, they probably would have been asked to renovate the, the bunk room so that egress could be um, more easily achieved. Uh, and when they grandfathered the boat, whenever you give something up, you need to get something in return. It was probably a good opportunity for the Coast Guard to ask these people to do something else and um, to make the egress a little more culpable. And, and the Coast Guard didn't. <clears throat> uh, other egress rules, the ABYC H3, uh, NFPA 302 and ISO 9094, uh, they're all, uh, they all mention egress through a galley and engine space is be being re restricted. Uh, hatch dimension requirements are mentioned and a second means of escape are all mentioned. So they're, they're generally pretty consistent. So the NTSB recommendations uh, here is to uh, uh, provide a secondary means of escape for boats, particularly with overnight accommodation spaces. <clears throat> and they want that to be in new T, old T, and new construction vessels. Um, the, the Coast Guard doesn't get, doesn't cooperate very well with the NTSB, uh, particularly with fire um, incidents and their recommendations. They're, um, it's really, I, I'm diabolical, I don't understand why, but they, they just don't cooperate much with the NTSB. Um, just to get back along the lines of egress, this is a 76 foot Lazara. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to make a comparison here between subchapter T vessels, which the conception was, and every other vessel. This is a 76 foot Lazara. The conception was 75 feet. Uh, this was at Miami Beach Marina. Fire broke out at 3 a.m. And uh, uh, the people got out through the salon with burns and cuts um, and one person broke their arm. Uh, but two, two teenagers were trapped in a port stateroom here. Um, they, they only had that, that porthole and they were waving and screaming out the porthole for help. And um, they, they put their clothes on and got in a shower expecting that they were going to have to run through the fire. Fortunately for them, somebody in a small boat saw what was going on and brought it over here. They put two firemen in the boat. Uh, they put a hose line off that finger pier. They put the hose line through the porthole and gave it to the kids to fight the fire from inside this bunk room. And they cut a hole in the side of the boat and pulled the kids out of the side of the boat. So, so this, this limited egress situation is not subject to tea vessels, the tea vessels, vessels alone. <clears throat> we see it all over the place in boats and the lack of egress makes it even a more complicated endeavor. This boat, three and a half, four million dollar Lazara, had no smoke alarms anywhere in it, and it should have. <clears throat> Here's another uh, view of a full beam master. Um, this boat has no windows, uh, no porthole, no egress, unless you go back into the common area. Here's another shot. Uh, this, unless you have a sledgehammer, you're not getting out of that window, and maybe not even with a sledgehammer. Uh, we do this a lot here. This next one escape hatch is right under the forward end of the racks that are holding that rigid inflatable. Uh, this is a boat that I sold. I spent a lot of time as a yacht broker um, and uh, I needed to do something. I don't remember what it was involving that hatch and I could not reach that hatch any, in any way, shape or form. If I stood on the bunks, they were too far forward. And this, this kind of complicated egress is something we see all over the place in the boating world. <clears throat> Uh, this is uh, the boat where these 34 people died. 
And this is a similar pleasure boat where, uh, you know, we may have the exact same uh, circumstances someday uh, as well. Now, this area right here, there's probably a hatch right there, but that's assuming you can get out of these staterooms into the common area and get out of the boat. So lastly, we've talked about prevention, uh, origin and cause. We've talked about detection, egress, and now suppression. <clears throat> the uh, conception passed the most of the recent uh, tests. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the, the, everything, there were no concerns or recommendations. Everything was in order. The uh, fire, there was a fire pump on this boat right here. If they maybe had three more minutes, maybe earlier, they might have been able to start that fire pump and fight the fire from the host stations, which were on either side of the boat. Uh, there were fire extinguishers in place, um, assuming that was compliant. And the only suppression efforts that went on that day were when the fire boats arrived a long time later. <clears throat> the um, one other event that happened just about a year ago today, uh, maybe another week from now, uh, Dixie Delight was a 43 foot houseboat that caught fire in uh, Jackson County Park Marina in Scottsboro, Alabama. The eight people died um, from the complications surrounding this fire. Uh, six children and two adults. Um, the owner awoke at 1235, uh, discovered his vessel filled with smoke. He saw flames in the area of the electrical panel. He dumped one extinguisher on it that he had in his boat and then went to a neighbor's boat. Long story short, the, the fire, they weren't able to manage this fire. Had there been a smoke alarm in the boat, he might have discovered the fire earlier where it was easier to handle. Uh, at the end of the day, this boat was only four months from being purchased. Uh, I don't know the circumstances with the survey, and if there was one, I don't know if they recommended smoke alarms, but they certainly should have. Uh, I read in the Marine Log uh, just yesterday that the SMS, the Coast Guard, is moving forward with plans to require that U.S. flag passenger vessels, which would be T vessels, and, uh, are, are to undergo the safety management system. Um, and this is what they did with the, the subchapter M uh, towing vessels. They have a safety management system. It also allows for third party um, surveyors to get involved with inspections on these kind of vessels. So there may be some additional job opportunities out there as well. In summary, there were uh, seven National Transportation Safety Board recommendations made to the Coast Guard. Three for interconnected smoke alarms, one for the roving patrol, and three more to improve the means of egress. Fires are not uncommon, but the devastation like this is uncommon. Uh, the Conception Fire was a detection and egress shortcoming that was measurable, predictable, but instead it was ignored and overlooked. The word detection and the word egress or escape appear in this NTSB document 377 times. And I'll leave you with that. That's my presentation. Um, any questions, uh, let me know if, if we don't have time for that, which I think we're right on schedule. Uh, my, my phone number and my email address are up there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. And, and thank you for, I suppose, putting that forensic view on things. And uh, you obviously studied it at a great length. And it's a tragic case. And uh, just one that I think, you know, saddened everybody. We, we've seen a lot of uh, information in the UK about it. And I always find it extraordinary that boats don't have smoke detectors. There have been some deaths also in the UK from CO, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning uh, from boats not fitted with CO detectors. I just think it's the duty of care of a surveyor to point these things out sometimes and just, just get, they're not expensive, these things. Uh, two quick points for you, one from Bob Turner. Thanks, John, for the past 15 years, I've incorporated into my reports the NFPA 302 12.3 requirements. Any vessel 26 feet and greater in length and equipped uh, with accommodation for sleeping shall have a smoke alarm installed and maintained. Uh, I believe this was introduced in 2006, but might be off a few years. I believe that the correct reference recently added CO detection, which is what I've just mentioned as well. Uh, George popped up and said, uh, 
Note that in 2013, the US Coast Guard issued a safety alert about the use of surge protection devices, or otherwise known as household power strips. Um, uh, Trevor says, thanks very much, very informative. And Captain Jack from Poland, how are you, Jack? Uh, says, excellent presentation. So there you are, some, some great feedback for you, John. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Could I just ask you to uh, stop your share, please?